Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We have, have had over 800 registrations for the uh, webinar tonight. Uh, we have an interdisciplinary panel discussion uh, on a collaborative approach to supporting people with coronary heart disease and depression. My name is Michael Murray. I'm a GP in Townsville with a special interest in wellness and psychological medicine. Um, our panel tonight is, um, is eclectic and talented and covers many different disciplines. Uh, Rob Grenfell is a um, GP who, practice near, who practices near Horsham in Victoria. He has a special interest in heart disease as well as being a rural doctor and he's well valued by the Heart Foundation for whom he consults. Uh, David Calhoun is a cardiologist in uh, Brisbane and he is also has been for many years an associate professor at the University of Queensland. He also has a special interest in wellness and cardiology. Dr. Rosemary Higgins uh, is a psychologist. She practices at Cabrini Hospital in Melbourne. She is a senior research fellow um, at the Heart uh, Research uh, Foundation. And lastly, we have uh, Nick Lozier. Uh, Nick is a uh, practices at the uh, RPH in Sydney. Uh, he is uh, associated with the Brain and Heart and Mind Institute um, in Sydney, and he is a professor of psychiatry. Now, to ensure that everybody has uh, an opportunity to participate, to ask questions, um, we have a few ground rules. Uh, be respectful of, of other participants and panelists. Behave as if this were a face-to-face -face activity. Post your comments and questions for panels in the general chat box. For help with technical issues, post in the technical help chat box. Be mindful that comments posted in the chat boxes can be seen by all participants and panelists. Your feedback is very important, so please complete the short exit survey, which will appear as a pop-up when you exit the webinar. We have some learning objectives for tonight. So through an interdisciplinary panel discussion about Sheila, you will have received the case study and read it. If you haven't, just uh, click back into NHPN and you'll be able to find it. At the completion of the webinar, participants will better understand the mental health indicators in the context of coronary heart disease, identify the key principles of the featured disciplines approach in screening, diagnosing, and supporting Sheila, and lastly, explore tips and strategies for interdisciplinary collaboration to support people like Sheila. We are very grateful for you all logging in tonight, and I trust that you have an enjoyable evening. We will now um, uh, move on to our GP, um, Rob Grenfell, and we will ask him to start his presentation. Thank you, Rob. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, what we um have with Sheila is a patient that uh, most of us in fact actually uh, know quite well in general practice, someone who's been coming to see us for a good 20 or so years. But the, the thing that strikes me first about uh, Sheila is uh, how uh, stoic she is and in fact actually how she tends to be using her intellect uh, as a cover and the sort of patient's actually pretty resistant to uh, complaining about things and uh, when they do complain about things, it's a matter of, uh, well, how sick are they? And the question that I always ask uh, with a patient um, coming to me with uh, these types of problems at the beginning is, um, what am I actually missing? And the, um, the thing behind that as we read through this case is, is that obviously from a general practice that Sometimes familiarity means that you actually do miss a lot of those cues because, again, a patient like this is a, is a real relief to see uh, in most of your days because they uh, will give you an intellectual conversation, you'll have a lot of things to talk about and you may in fact actually be uh, outfoxed by them and not talk about the type of problems that she's really got or she may downplay those and be more interested in talking about other things. So thank you, Michael. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, and, and I guess um, as, as we moved through there, we, we, we you know, thankfully saved her life around 56 by picking up some um, uh, occluded uh, coronaries. But uh, as reported by her husband, she just doesn't seem to be doing the best. And uh, you know, why is it that, you know, for someone who's still 
you know, a young person, let's face it, uh, and, and, and how serious is this condition and what's, um, what's actually leading to this. And so again, the question comes to me about what's actually not being said because we've got a report here from her uh, husband that she's, she just doesn't seem to be um, how she is, but uh, you know, she herself is not letting on with that. So next slide, thanks, Michael. Now, the thing with um, when, you, when, when you're looking at uh, you know, the whole patient, you tend to be thinking about, uh, well, I guess the patient directs you to where, you, where and what you're going to be talking about. And they will, um, unless you question them, they probably won't talk about some of the insecurities and some of the problems. And this, of course, is a, is a major, um, major problem. But again, physical conditions deteriorate, and as we age, um, the condition itself would deteriorate, and this is this is where, um, with this particular patient, it's suddenly to work out uh, the cues that were picked up in this case was she's not doing the best that she could, and that was the the, the trigger for going back to the cardiologist and the insistence from the GP. And again, I can I can relate to this this issue with an intelligent patient who's not really telling you about. You've you've got your uh, radar up, and you think, hold on, this is a complaint from someone who doesn't complain. We need to deal with this. So uh, next um, slide, thanks, Michael. And I guess the thing is, again, she's young. Um, at 72 years of age, this is not an old patient by my standards. Um, so many of my rural patients were well in their 80s and are still farming. So someone at 72 is talking about uh, some shortness of breath or some uh, difficulty, in fact, actually doing physical activity or those things is, is something that the alarm bells are going off for me. Uh, and, and, and why is the therapy not working? Um, my first thing I often think about is the knowing that adherence is an extremely um, uh, poor thing for particularly people after they've had a heart attack. Unfortunately, most people have ceased their medications by two years. And I'd be asking, is she actually taking a medication? Is she compliant to these? And probably the last question I've always got myself uh, is, is my diagnosis wrong? And uh, I guess that's really the essence of medical practice. That's why we call it practice because we're forever practicing it, and I guess ultimately we retire when we think we've got it right, Michael. Thank you very much, Rob. And now we'll move on to David Colquhoun, a consultant uh, cardiologist. David? Yeah, well, an important thing in patients with coronary disease, if we go to the first slide, is that uh, 30 to 40 percent uh, around the time of their admission to hospital have um, at least mild depression. Uh, major depression may be around about 20% um, and it's usually missed. This is a slide that demonstrates six years after the heart attack in the Australian Lipid trial, which was a trial that investigated Pravastatin versus placebo, we used the Beck depression inventory, which is commonly used in um, research studies, and 27% of males and 38% of females had a BDI2 greater than 10, which is at least mild depression. Um, so this is very prevalent condition um, and had nothing to do uh, with baseline character of what your cholesterol is or whether you're on statins or not statins. In fact, this is the first trial that really showed statins don't cause depression. So you can see this is a very prevalent risk factor. Uh, and the Heart Foundation 2003 reviewed all the data and pointed out that depression is an independent risk factor of heart disease, independent of um, you know cholesterol, uh, hypertension. So it's a very prevalent risk factor. Um, now if we move on to the next slide, how does it uh, stack up to classic risk factors? It would see depression down the bottom there. If you've got even just depressed mood and you don't fulfill the criteria for depression according to DSM-5, that still influences prognosis as you can see, uh, similar to the classic risk factors. Uh, the thing is it took uh, at least a decade uh, to get uh, doctors to be measuring cholesterol and treating it, I think will take a lot longer here. So this is a very prevalent risk factor. Um, but there's stigma associated with it. There's a lot of people believe, oh, look, it's just a reaction to illness. But more importantly, if we go to the next slide, even when we go to the first teaching hospital in the world, the creme de la creme, if you like, uh, you know, the Johns Hopkins, just focus down on the, on the first dot point. 75% of cardiologists missed it, even though they knew that the patients were being screened in the coronary care unit there, 
nurses, much the same, consultants, registrars, we're all equally not good using our impressionistic medicine when we're doing rounds in the primary care unit. And then are the ones we said had depression, look at that, 24% false positive, so we're not very good. Clearly, we need a tool to help us. Measuring diabetes in ancient Egypt, we tasted the urine, and we said, oh, sugar in the urine, that's diabetes. We need something better, we've got blood tests. We're going to move to the next one. The Heart Foundation, following the example, next slide, the example of the American Heart Association, we reformed our uh, stress working group, and uh, Nick is part of our group, Nick Lossier, and we agreed with the Americans that a screening tool, they get the ball rolling. The PHQ-2, the Patient Health Questionnaire, these two questions here, really simple. When you're using the Patient Health Questionnaire, the two questions, it's over the past month. And anyone can remember this. Have you often been bothered by feeling down, have a sort of press? Yes or no? During the past month, have you often been bothered by little interest or pleasure in doing things? These two simple questions are more than 90% sensitive to the development for the diagnosis of depression. In other words, they're mandatory questions. Now look, it's self-fulfilling, because if we look at DSM-5, and here we have the handbook here, um, the first two questions for diagnosis of major depression, you must have one or two of those questions that say over the next two weeks. Um, and then you need four out of five of the other questions and what are these other questions? Go to the Heart Foundation website. Here it is here. We can see on the camera. Uh, this is on the Heart Foundation website. And you can, if you want to do, look at all the other questions here and score if you like. Um, and our patient here, poor old um, Sheila, she has probably, if we ask her directly, she says yes to probably both of the above. And she's also got trouble sleeping, feeling tired and worn out. And shortness of breath is frequently a cause of, uh, is related to depression. The next slide is this very simple screening tool, which we all can remember, or questions rather than a tool. Um, it has prognostic information. This is from the uh, San Francisco Heart and Soul Study. We can just go to the next slide. Just saying yes to either of those two questions has a major influence on prognosis. Saying yes to either, 55% greater cardiovascular events over the next uh, six year follow up. That is very powerful prediction. Now, a lot of the, the uh, uh, depression is accounted for by smoking, non exercise, all those other things, and non compliance. But that's a very important predictor that we need to do something. Now, how can we do it? Next slide. Those two questions we're introducing into our hospital are uh, the nurses put the stamp on. Okay, so right. it's there. Rather than stamps, there's someone at risk of DBT. This is far more important. The nurses love uh, 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 this idea of doing the screening because they do it anyway. They do it when the patients are going to rehab. Let's do it formally there. And that highlights to the doctors and anyone else, this patient uh, may be at risk of depression, need to have further follow-up. So I think I might stop there, Michael, because uh, from the cardiologist's perspective, depression or low mood is frequent frequently missed, and it has important prognostic information there, and it's as important as diabetes, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia. Thank you very much, David. That, that sets, the, sets the tone for the rest of the evening, I think. Now, we'll just hear from our psychologist, Rosemary. Uh, yes, Rosemary. I just want to firstly thank the um, cardiologist for measuring depression. That was brilliant. Now, Sheila's presenting with some worsening health issues. She has that reluctance to bother the cardiologist that um, Rob was talking about as well with the GP. The fear of the emotional impact of further health issues, some anxiety and panic, grief, free loss of strength and ageing, some positive response to the depression screen, and symptoms which, you know, depression symptoms, cardiac symptoms, other symptoms, also sleep problems and low coping self-efficacy. She's not sure if she'll be able to cope. Then looking at it, the precipitating factors for why now their husband has retired, that retirement of a spouse can create quite a lot of pressure. Cancelled holiday, there could be some guilt and tension regarding that. 
possible trauma and anxiety from the previous surgery and the infection. Uh, she's an internaliser and person who seems to put her own needs last. And there's been a large amount of threat to her role. Cognitive decline is possible and also what's the meaning of worn down. These are the sorts of things I'd like to know a little bit more about. In terms of the perpetuating factors, as we said, she's an internaliser. We're not sure about her perceptions of the illness, You know what she thinks her illness is, what it represents. Um, we're not quite sure. We know that she values strength and health, and that's a big source of pride. So this is a major loss in terms of identity, and perhaps sees illness as a weakness. Her family relationship role, she doesn't seem to be, we don't have anything about her community or her friends, so there's some concern that she might be isolated. We don't know anything about her self-management skills and capacity, and it seems that she hasn't gone to cardiac rehabilitation. In terms of the protective factors, it would be really nice if she had an adult daughter. That's a lovely thing to have as a patient. There's her medical support, her husband, her own independence and resilience, whereas it gets in the way of her seeking help, it will also assist her in some ways. A previous history of good coping, but unsure at the moment about her health behaviours or her social support. And really with, with her I'd be wanting to work on values, on what she values, what her personal goals are, getting her physically active perhaps a bit of mindfulness, some cognitive behaviour therapy. But I'd really like to get her into the cardiac rehabilitation and get some group support going and possibly some sleep intervention, maybe self-management support or empowerment. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, so that's really fleshing it all out for us now. Um, uh, Robert and David have set the, uh, the scene from a medical point of view, from the general practitioner's point of view, looking at, th at things that can go wrong uh, and looking at the possible um, misdiagnosis of eutonia rather than uh, a depressive episode when somebody presents with heart disease. Uh, and Rosemary has looked at the factors, uh, the protecting factors and the precipitating factors and the perpetuating factors. And now we're going to move on to our psychiatrist, Nick, and um, we'd like to hear from you now, Nick, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the role of a psychiatrist in this is, uh, I see very much really about um, supporting the general practitioner in the primary sort of pivotal management of someone like this, um, and potentially being there as part of a stepped or collaborative care approach to managing someone like this and also potentially helping um, the psychologist as well. These are the people I see very much as the first line and we really, psychiatrist role is very much for um, information, advice and potentially if things don't go well or there's a failure to improve. So on one level, you know, people may like a diagnosis confirmed. Certainly, of course, you've got the, by the time someone actually agrees to come to see someone like me, they have taken on board the idea that they may or they may have a, um, a psychiatric or psychological condition. Now, in many of these cases, many of her symptoms could be both anxiety or depression or the mixture of the two of them. And I think actually the difference is moot at the, often at the, at the, at the initial level. Um, I think what, what we would probably be doing is looking at an initial one-off assessment to provide advice, a kind of sort of 291 or 296, and actually examine what kind of uh, treatment that Sheila and or Hugh um, would prefer, whether we can go to um, a sort of time-limited treatment for um, problem-solving CBT, interpersonal therapy, or medication, or both, as well as some other treatments I'll talk about. Interestingly, I, although in this particular case I would advocate taking a patient or couple-centered approach, given the background, some of the data shows that bringing the family in actually can be negative at times, um, potentially to do with stigma. So if you could move on to the next slide, please. 
So if we confirm that she's depressed, or it's obvious, uh, and uh, one of the areas we'd be looking at is actually extending the PHQ-2 into the PHQ-9, and uh, those tools actually make psychiatrists diagnosed better as well than when they're allowed to do things just off their own back. Um, you take a look at what are the kind of treatment recommendations. And I think the, the one that actually has by far the most evidence behind it, the best evidence, is actually exercise. So everyone's talking about behavioral activation and exercise, and people might, we might have to help address A, how that happens, and B, potentially her fears about that, of how one might start that and tailor that to her. Then, as I said, you've got to talk about the potential for sort of more focused uh, antidepressant treatments, be that both medication or time-limited psychotherapy. And access could be an issue for the psychotherapeutic um, interventions. Um, I've done a trial actually showing that some of the internet-based um, psychotherapeutic interventions are not as effective, but they are effective and they're free and they, they are readily available if people can't get to see a psychotherapist or other um, treating clinician in that way. Um, if you do go down to the medication route, then I think it would be very important to actually look, um, treat this in a, in a very sort of standardized way, keeping track of her symptoms, keeping track of the side effects, particularly any of the more severe side effects, and very much looking at adherence. As Rob said, I think adherence, compliance, concordance, really, really important. People who are depressed are three times more likely to be non-adherent than people who are not depressed. That's a really big issue. And again, we can use other, other parts of the health system as well, so sessions with an exercise physiologist or dietitian to help in addressing diet and other well-being factors. Next slide, please. There's another of symptoms, and others have highlighted the idea of, of sleep disorder. So one of the areas I'm particularly interested in is actually treating sleep disorder and evaluating whether it's an insomnia she has, whether we're looking at some kind of phase advance, i.e. people whose phase system, their body clock becomes out of kilter with their environment, um, and actually treating this specifically. And there are a range of things from the very sort of simple sleep hygiene to the more specific CBTI approaches, again, both face-to-face -face or the Internet, which could be done. Um, I wouldn't necessarily be going down the benzodiazepine route, and if this is a problem, one might consider some of the more sedating antidepressants if required. We talked about the psychological impacts, her role change from a coping care to, to what is she now, where does she see herself, and all the aspects that have been brought up earlier on. I think the fatigue is an interesting issue. People have flagged up the idea, well, you know, what is the cause? Is this some heart failure? Is this depression? Is there something else going on? Is, there another, is this a result of sleep disturbance of some cause? And again, with someone who's expressing some health anxieties, you've always got to balance those issues around how far do you investigate versus good history taking. And continual investigation can actually exacerbate people's health anxieties rather than, um, rather than actually making people more reassured. You know, the, the classic, I don't think there's anything wrong with you, but I'm just going to do a brain scan just in case. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we've all we've talked about very much the family concerns and particularly the husband's concerns. Are, you know, what is what are his concerns about her illness and what the impact might be on there? Looking at diet, looking at enjoyable activities. This is someone who's been a coper and carer all of her life. And what things does she want? What does she actually want out of treatment? What does she want to achieve in her life? As everyone said, she's still really quite young family involvement. And one thing I'd be quite concerned about with, with this woman is just checking her cognition. I'd do a mini mental state exam or get ask someone else to do that, particularly early on. Um, there's qu quite likely if she is depressed and potentially with a cardiac history that she has some uh, cognitive impairment. But I'd be interested to see whether this improves as her depression and cardiovascular risks are addressed or whether there might be something underlying um, her cognitive, some underlying cognitive dysfunction that may be driving some of her anxiety and concerns. Um, and the other area, particularly if she's technically literate, is we're using increasing amounts of the measured self, you know, sleep and mood diaries, sleep applications, sleep cognitive, cognitive training through things like luminosity, the use of pedometers. So really getting her engaged in our own health management. And that's it, I think, for my, my particular aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. So we've gone through the four panelists. Uh, we've had the setting of um, the general practice um, um, aspect, the specialist aspect, um, specialist cardiologist aspect, the psychologist and the psychiatrist.
title. We're now going to move on to the panel um, conversation start, uh, discussion. And I did note uh, that there was a question from one of our attendees, John Clark, where is the exercise physiologist? And that leads me on to uh, ask Rosemary to, uh, you were concerned, Rosemary, that, um, that this patient hadn't um, been for cardiac rehabilitation and you had some questions to ask around that. Yes. Um Many patients do miss out on cardiac rehabilitation and, and that is a concern. Um, cardiac rehabilitation is very good for mobilising patients and it also explains and talks about emotional health as well as physical health. They can get access to all the health professionals and they, um, there's enough evidence to say that it, it does help, it does assist. And I think that Sheila, had she gone to cardiac rehabilitation, would have early tackled the exercise and got a lot more confidence and maybe that would have helped her with her mood issues as well. And Rob, from your, from your consulting with the Heart Foundation, it, what would be the main reason why somebody wouldn't be able to uh, get into rehab? Uh, unfortunately, um, Michael, in, in today's climate, only one in four heart attack sufferers actually referred in the first place to cardiac rehab. So the problem begins at the hospital. And some of our therapies, of course, are, are lasting uh, you know, two, three, four days at the maximum. And uh, sometimes they're patted on the shoulder and said, you're fixed um, after a stent's been put in. And so they, they're not even encouraged from the care team in the hospital. That's something that, from the Heart Foundation's perspective, that we're, we're trying to address from the health professional. The, the next challenge, of course, is when they turn up to you in your general practice. And I used to play this sort of game, um, how long will the discharge summary take to get to me? Um, and particularly the, the more rural you are, and I was um, isolated rural, often you'd leave, never see the discharge summary, so you, you wouldn't have an idea about where the follow-up was. The next is, uh, is the patient, um, do they think that rehab's relevant? So a young patient versus an older patient, group therapy, if you've got to drive 50 or 100 kilometre round trip to go to cardiac rehab, are you going to go? Um, how does this in fact actually fit into my life um, as to where it is? And probably the other pressing thing is denial. A, another patient factor is that um, I'm right now, my symptoms are resolved, I don't need to do this or I'm not going to deal with this. And, and those, are, those are some of the um, reasons why someone won't get rehab. But probably the main one is uh, doctors, we're failing our patients by not referring them on. David, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, well, at the two hospitals that I practice at, uh, we agreed 25 years ago that all patients can be approached, the cardiologists can be approached by our liaison paddock rehabilitation nurse and every single patient is invited to join. So you don't have to, it's just silly to say you have to be referred, it's a routine thing. So I'm at the private hospitals, everyone gets involved. Now, I can't say that happens in our public hospitals, uh, that necessarily happens that way because they don't necessarily have rehab units. But um, with cost cutting and other things, um, honestly, there's no excuse for it. But let me just say, my colleagues are more interested in doing the high end, doing balloons and stents and stuff. Um, and the patients are in and out very quickly, as Rob points out. And they're focused on this stuff, using the toys, if you like, rather than the long term things that are very important the most important to how patients feel about themselves and quality of life. So it's partly the system, but let me just say, all you have to do is get your mates together and you have the meeting, and the nurses love this. They support the patients, and everyone's approached in my in my hospitals for the last 20 something years. Thanks very much. Nick, do you have any comments, uh, uh, David and, and Robert alluded to it there, on the, um, the benefits of group therapy via cardiac rehab uh, as against individual therapy? Uh, the, the, the first comment I have in this particular, and I think we, we heard it alluded to there, is if you want to do things and get, and get good treatment across everybody, one of the things we, you know, we, we understand is that some people get stigmatized, certain groups either through their own denial or because of the way that doctors consider them, tend to not be invited to certain treatments. We know that people with depression get fewer angioplasties and fewer stents despite being a high risk group. And in fact, they have, in, in a paper I reviewed recently, a longer door to needle time in the emergency department as well. So there's a whole bunch of system things. And as they've alluded to, I think something interesting is the idea, if you ask doctors to do things, 
it often things fall through the cracks, really. Whereas when you actually set up systems and you use the professions allied to medicine and it becomes part of their systematic jobs, things happen. Systems happen. Patients get better care. So establishing those systems for cardiac rehab identification really can work well when the systems are embedded and put in place. Okay, uh, Go ahead, sorry. Uh, in, in terms of actual the, the cardiac rehabilitation, and, um, it, the, the actual rehab area is, is not my, my specific area, but I've certainly seen some really good results from group treatments there. And the group can often sort of help break down some of the barriers about how people feel about their illness, the implications, the perceptions, and actually can lead to a kind of sort of group think about treatment and particularly around behavioral modifications as well, rather than necessarily adherence to medication. Yeah. Thanks very much. Michael? Nick, you had a question that you wanted to ask um, in relation to the issues that, that we noticed between the couple in, in relation to confidentiality, carer, family discord, etc. Could you expand on that, please? The... <laughs> I, I think several of us have, have alluded to um, the issue that this is a couple. They share the same GP. Um, there appear to be some imbalances. So, for instance, Sheila has been caring for Hugh for many, many years, cared for the family. She's taken on a specific role, um, potentially enabled him to live, his, to live his life, do other things. He's retired, wants to, do, wants to do something, go on a trip. That has failed because of her illness. So looking at the different roles that the two of them are playing and how those may be changing could be really, really important. And particularly, potentially, some of Hugh's anxieties about what is actually going on with his wife, this sort of stoic, solid, supporting rock who's been with him for so many years and what his concerns might be. And the flags up interest in confidentiality issues. Don't, will Sheila want her husband to know about her diagnosis? Would she want him any communication about a potential psychological or psychiatric condition being given to someone like you? Um, so the confidentiality and the boundaries will be a really important one to play out. And um, this is where all those really, really important GP management and, and sort of social skills come into it. Anybody else have any thoughts on the how to, how to broach the problem with the couple? Oh, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, there, there will, might well be some tensions there between um, with the holiday cancelled and Sheila feeling like she's let Hugh down. Um, there's, I would like them to just ex get them both in together and get them to actually try and talk about it a bit and for him to realise, you know, what's going on with her in her mood that it might not be his fault or might not be anything he's done and but it also might not be something that he can fix because he he's probably quite a practical man and likes to get things fixed and you know move on to the next problem so yeah. that's that's a bit of a challenge yes, yes. David you had a, a very good question um, for the rest of the panel in relation to how long we could wait before we see an improvement in depression could you expand on that please uh, well, first of all, I'd just like to say rehabilitation literature has shown over the last uh, 30 years improvement in cardiovascular outcomes. And consistent with what Nick said in exercise, only programs that have an exercise component appear to be associated with improved cardiovascular outcomes. So we've had two major trials uh, in the last uh, 12 months that have shown improvement not only in depression, but also improved cardiovascular outcomes with the exercise. And, and it appears that exercise and for most patients with mild depression is as good as a drug. So it's, uh, it fits in with what we've been saying for the last 30 years, but it's good to hear uh, a psychiatrist saying, uh, get out and exercise. I think it's fantastic, Nick. Um, but uh, in terms of the response, um, you know, it, I mean, in response to any therapy, it often we say takes six to eight weeks uh, with, with depression, but honestly, in my experience, a lot of people feel a lot better within a week or two when you've been able to, uh, you know, just say, look, what's troubling you is not a blocked artery. You know, you're not slipping, you're not, you're feeling down. Um, and it, it, this is to do with, you know, your mood. And um, people often respond much faster than they're meant to. 
uh, by simply unloading a little to their cardiologist like we actually pay attention. I think paying attention makes a lot of, uh, a lot of sense um, and that's why so many placebo treatments work well because um, you know, patients do heal themselves by just by just paying attention to being nice to them. Yeah, yeah, Michael, I'd I'd, I'd have to agree. Talking to a patient's a good good idea, uh, and, and asking that question. I think this is where we've been remiss is uh, we, we haven't um, posed that question about you know how are you going, and that's what's so good about the P. Uh, BQ2 because it's really, that's effectively you're asking that age old question, how are things going? Um, how are you feeling? Um, and, and, and then in fact actually allowing to listen because I think with this case, uh, again the trust and I, I've been looking at uh, some of the comments that are coming up there, the, the, the trust is the issue. As a GP over 20 um, odd years, uh, you will have that trust and you will have a fair idea about um, how far you can go with regards to talking the two patients through the issues separately and then bringing them together. Can I just come in on a, on a comment by uh, David Drummond um, talking about NMI survivor and I think he, he raised a very interesting point about how rehabilitation is often short term and many of the things we see post myocardial infarction, post stroke is really looking at the impact about the polypharmacy, the number of drugs and treatments that people are meant to be on. I wondered uh, uh, with David and Rob how they deal with those kind of aspects. Well, uh, I'll go first, I guess, Rob. Um, there are key drugs that improve survival and need to be life term. It's really the lipid lowering therapy and the aspirin. After that, um, only if you have heart failure or some complication. So for the simple uncomplicated infarct, it's the, uh, the statin plus or minus the fibrate and the aspirin long term after the first year. So it actually can be quite simple. And I must admit I try and make it as simple as possible because there's only so much you can swallow in, you know, honestly in a day. Yep. Right, any comments yeah, on that? Yeah, I have to agree with you there, David, that you know, number one on your list uh, in the long term, of course, is your, is your statin. It's the, you know, the evidence has shown uh, on how it works. Um, uh, the aspirin, of course, uh, again, um, there's uh, substantial evidence for that for preventing further events. And I'd agree with you that uh, we, we talk about in our guidelines the use of uh, ACE inhibition and that really depends on where's the blood pressure setting but also what's the um, cardiac muscle function like and, you know, ceasing that from a GP's perspective is really something you talk to your cardiologist about if, you, if you're looking at that. But let's bear in mind, you know, once you start to get over three tablets, people stop taking them. Um, and you've got to uh, wonder are, are they in fact actually on them or not. Um, but largely I would tend to say that secondary prevention which is taking the medications after a heart attack is for the rest of your life. You don't have a, um, um, a much of a say in those if you want to prevent that because the most likely person to have a heart attack uh, in Australia today is someone who's already had one. Can I, just that can be, uh, can I say some copy in here? Yes, with me. Yeah, uh, that it can be quite confronting for patients to be put on on those drugs when when I it is so important for them to take it, but there might be a lot of psychological work in there as well because they can. It's really about confronting the fact that they have a chronic illness, not an acute illness, and um, people may see this illness as something with episodes like serious episodes, like Sheila seems to have had a serious episode, but not really been. Uh, looking at this as a chronic long-term illness to manage for the rest of their life and that can be quite a challenge and part of that can be around confronting that death anxiety as well, that knowing that you're mortal. So there's, there's quite a lot of um, you know, ways to work with Sheila around that or any patient. Yeah, right, but can I just come in here and I think we need to put to bed this uh, nonsense on cattle that Rob was on I explain to patients, it is fantastic what we can do now. Whether you have Questran to lower cholesterol or niacin or the statins which are the easiest, over 200,000 patients in randomised trials have shown the same thing. For every one millimole reduction of LDL cholesterol, there's 25% reduction of heart attack, 20% reduction of stroke, 10% reduction of mortality. And in my patients and in all patients, you honestly can get two millimole reductions. So we say, look, we are halving your risk 
of having a heart attack. And this is incredible. We couldn't do this in the past. And I, I say to them, the biggest side effect of taking these drugs is that you may well live longer. So Absolutely. it's a great side effect. Yeah, and living with chronic illness is a success. It's fantastic. Not like this mm. dismal stuff you hear from health ministers. It's always chronic illness. It's fantastic. In the past, people died. We live longer than any other country in the world. And we are apparently the happiest, apparently, outside, within the OECD. But that's a miserable group of people, right? What about Denmark? No, we're happier than them. <laughs> that's just you in Brisbane. <laughs> well, we are the most livable city in the world, just quietly, Nick. Oh, you're making this up now. Look at you. <laughs> Can I... I the, the, I, we're going back to, uh, to someone like Sheila. This is someone who comes in, she screams. I'm interested with uh, Rob, what he feels his um, colleagues, what would happen in primary care? Would she immediately be referred on? Would you try an initial treatment? Would you actually do a watching and waiting for a couple of weeks? What, what would you do, Rob, if, if, with this person? Look, uh, Nick, with this, with this patient, this depression has clearly been going on for uh, some time. And uh, it's a lot more complicated than, than, than this stock standard one. I mean, I guess somebody straight after a heart attack, my, my first thought is, uh, as, as David was talking about before, is bring it to the fore, talk about it, talk about this uh, normalising uh, normalizing this, but also for understanding what they un uh, understand about what's happened to them and, and the changes that it's actually brought on in their life. And, and, and just seriously following them up. And working out is this a problem or is this just a transient thing? I think with Sheila, this is this is not transient. The issue of, um, of medication is one that um, I I would be considering in, in this patient because there is um, some some significant uh, issues with regards to life functioning and others. Although I, I again I come back to your uh, point about cognition and cognition testing because we all know that the brain is just a um, a heart that thinks really because it's, uh, if the blood vessels around your heart are no good, the ones around your brain are probably no good either. And uh, we all know that dementia is one of the most rapid diseases in Australia. So I'd be worried about cognition. The, the, the thing about medication, I, I probably would be talking with the uh, cardiologist first about uh, would I um, use this and is this an issue. But the, the second part for uh, either treatment or um, uh, depression or depression that I felt was uh, too severe or more complex, I'd be definitely getting um, a, a consultation liaison uh, appointment from a psychiatrist. The data now that if if someone like Sheila is amenable, then cardiologists and GPs should, with someone with a relatively severe depression, be starting SSRIs pretty quickly. I think uh, you know that we can argue the pros and cons of whether or not um, we over-prescribe. Or under-prescribe. I think it's more in Australia the targeting of prescriptions. And I think, oh. well, you know, after a heart attack or whatever, it's right to feel depressed. And certainly I think if you take an approach where they've had it for, and you've seen these people and you know what they're previously like and now they've changed and you've seen them two, a couple of times, you know, multiple attendances with different symptoms aren't necessarily a heart, heart condition. And again, multiple symptom complaints would be a real flag for depression. I think people should be starting SSRIs probably quite quickly. We know that they are effective or, you know, they're not magic bullets. They're reasonably effective. And we know that they're generally safe in people with heart conditions. You have to consider what else she's taking. But I'd certainly be an advocate that we should probably be using more of these in a targeted fashion and earlier and by non-psychiatrists. Yeah, Nick, it's David Cahoon here. I don't know whether I'm on air. You are, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I was an investigator in the Sad Heart Trial post a heart attack and we one of the two sites in Australia. And uh, that showed clearly the safety of uh, sertraline and the efficacy above placebo. Um, so it is certainly a safe, safe. And there's only 300 patients in that trial and we almost got statistical significant decreased cardiovascular events over six months. So, um, uh, you know, it is, there's no doubt about it being safe. Uh, and if, uh, you know, you stop, you can always stop later. Uh, you know, and the thing is, we need to screen not just at the time of the infarct, but, uh, you know, from Sydney where you are now, um, as you know, um, Gordon Parker has demonstrated at Prince of Wales infarct patients if they develop depression the month afterwards, that actually is worse prognosis 
at least in people in Sydney, than people who have it at the time of the heart attack. But yes, too many of my colleagues have dismissed depression. Oh, it's just a reaction to the illness, they're going to get better. Well, six years later, 30% have got depression still. We've, we found the same at the Heart Research Centre, that it's the, um, it's the later depression rather than the in-hospital distress that is predictive of mortality. So it's really um, not, not just the thinking about their distress in hospital, but looking at two months down the track and looking at the trajectory of depression where the depression improves over time, their distress improves over time, or it gets worse and we really worry about the ones that get worse or that it doesn't change because for many people it will improve because it, having distress early on is probably a natural and normal response to a life-threatening or a perceived life-threatening event. Sure. The, I mean, uh, the venue yeah, flagging up something can interesting. I, can, I, can I just pop in there because there are a few other topics we, we need to cover before we finish. It sounds as if everybody knows what should be done and everybody agrees on what should be done. Uh, you had a question, Sheila, in relation to uh, increasing the empowerment of Sheila um, to improve self-management. Management, could you expand on that? Sheila, is that Rosemary? Sorry, sorry, Rosemary. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, yeah. You, you had a question um, about Sheila. About her... Um, uh, ma her feelings about managing her illness, her knowledge of her illness, and I think it'd be very important to to work very closely with her about her establishing her goals for you know for getting as well as she can in terms of whether it's physical fitness or mental health or you know social relationships, what it is and getting her to um, set her goals and working with her to achieve her goals, that's where... So we'll be talking about using a combination of cardio and psychoeducation? I would say so, yes. Does anybody else have any thoughts about that, about coordinating that care? I was just wondering, <laughs> Rosemary hinted before, David here, David Kane, um, in Mayville or V, she's scared to death of dropping dead, and that's why rehab units started up in the 60s and 70s by the Heart Foundation. So they're absolutely scared. They're in bed for you know two or three months, and the doctors, everyone, kept them in bed. Uh, you know, it may be very well underlined this as Rosemary hinted it before. She's scared to death of uh, you know catastrophe around the corner, and I, I guess that needs to be explored. This lady, who's a very competent lady, she's a retired professor of art, so she's no dill. And it could be also that the husband's scared to death of her dropping dead, and he's restricting her as well and doing, we, we're not quite sure what's going on, who's, where the anxiety is. Yeah, so would are, the existential therapies be of use, do you think? I believe so, yes. I think it'd be very important to um, get her to talk around, you know, what the values that she has and how she um, thinks about her life, what she's achieved, what she's created, what the meaning is. You know, all of that I think is very important with the patient who's coming to terms with the fact that they're mortal. Yeah. Thanks very much. Nick, do you have any comments on that? Because you put up, up a, a, a corner of, uh, of therapies, um, you know, going all the way from IPT down. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to get across very much the idea that I, the, I think that Sheila should be involved in the treatment modality and the evidence is that both antidepressants and psychological therapies both work in this context um, and the evidence is that we can take problem-solving therapies and a lot of it really depends upon her preference for the approach. Interestingly, we spend a lot of time talking about um, matching treatments to particular characteristics of patients. The reality from all of the studies is um, it's not so much whether the particular treatment modality is better or worse, because we really can't show that. It's how good the therapist is. You know, the reason why um, you know, the All Blacks are better rugby players is not because they play a different type of rugby. They just have different, different players than, than some of the other teams. 
Um, so I put up those particular things because it really depends upon actually getting good therapists to do good therapy. So if you're a CBT therapist, if you're an IBT therapist, if you're a problem-solving therapist, you do that and you do that well. Many, most therapists are actually eclectic when it comes down to it and use a bunch of different modalities that might be appropriate for the right kind of, for the person who is involved. And again, you know, so the better the therapist, and we, you know, we all know who are the good therapists, the ones that we work with um, quite consistently in those areas. Whether or not the two are actually complementary in this particular group of people, we actually don't know. We do know that that is true and that drugs and therapy are a little bit complementary generally. You don't get an additive effect. You don't get the effect of the drugs and of the therapy together. They're a little bit additive. So I have bunged up a bunch of different things, but you can pick and choose. I think the issues about access, about rurality is important. And knowing that there are many of these interventions available over the net, and more importantly, that these interventions are much better than health information. There is some good health information on the net. There's some rubbish health information on the net. And these interventions delivered by, um, I, think, I can give you a number of them. There's eCouch. There's Beating the Blues. There's Shut Eye for Insomnia. We know they are better than good health information and better than placebo. So looking at those access issues, I think it can be really important in many areas of Australia. Thanks, Nick. Rob, do you have any comments on how we engage with patients? Yes, sorry, Michael, I just missed that last bit uh, of the question. Sorry, uh, do, you, do you have any comments on how we should engage with patients, assuming that you doesn't have any cognitive de deficits, uh, what's the best way to engage with them? Well, well, again, uh, this, this is to talk about how um, she doesn't seem to be making as much progress as she should be. Uh, uh, you know, the position that she's in is she's a young woman and that you'd expect that she would be able to enjoy her, um, her retirement um, far better than she, than she is and uh, so if you've got anything to think about uh, or anything to say about in, in that perspective. And then, then, then opening up on um, uh, exploring what her thoughts and fears are about that because often the patient will say, we, we've had a lot of um, comments there about you know, she's worried about dying and I think David sort of put that as well. That, um, these things need to be opened up, and once you have opened those up, is to determine whether or not, as the GP, uh, I can deal with that. And I, I really do like one of the comments there was absolutely good old-fashioned active listening, and yeah. and that would be the start. If you're isolated, rural, great idea. Um, sit back and listen, and then work out well what resources have I got. And I'd, I'd agree with what Nick said. Uh, you can arrange uh, in, in a, a number of rural areas contact through even it's just for yourself as a GP to be uh, discussing a case with a psychiatrist. Um, or even better still, there's uh, increasing uh, access to telemedicine services for that. But the most important thing is trust that the patient's got, um, trying to get involved with as we've talked about with uh, other family members, definitely the partner, and uh, this person needs a care plan, a chronic disease management care plan to be effectively managed across uh, a range of um, activities. And one of the interesting things um, that I've often found is that sometimes help comes in uh, in some of the most unusual perspectives. Some of my typical chronic disease patients um, would sometimes find with either, say, a, a nurse specialist in areas of rehabilitation um, that they, in fact, would actually break the veneer and uh, would, would develop a, a quite a deep um, rapport. So it's a matter of really working with other people. In, in, in having these patients come back to see you for a six-week check, say. Are they ah. still depressed in, in general? Uh, well, it's the quick screen hospital, but the real screen for me is the everyone who is under me in hospital sees me four to six weeks afterwards. Um, and we get an appointment before they leave. Uh, and that's usually where, where you know things really, really move because almost always it's with their spouse. 
Um, now some feel a bit better, some don't. Um, but you know, I usually do the PHQ2 then. Um, and you know what, the thing is, and Nicola I'm sure and others will say, look it's not important which treatment you use for depression as long as you use something. And we've got long term follow up. You know, people feel better with, obviously with the treatment of depression, whatever you use, go for a walk, uh, you know, use your SSRI, uh, cognitive therapy. Um, but that does lead on to increased compliance with everything else we like people to do. And those who get better, irrespective of whether it's placebo or whatever, they have better cardiovascular outcomes. So um, it's, uh, I haven't quite answered your question, but it's just part of the routine asking questions. How are you going today? Look, it's a routine thing. Over the last month since I saw you, you're feeling, been bothered by feeling down or hopeless or, you know, and then, I, you know, and, and then we ask about, uh, you know, pleasure in doing things. Um, so it just sort of rolls off. I know it's called formal PHQ2, but that's only just to make sure that we think about it. But um, you know, it is surprising how subtle it can be. And males can can disagree, and you see the wife saying rubbish. You know, like yeah. but they sometimes just don't want to talk about the male. Thanks very much, David. Now, as usual with MHPN webinars, they fly by. The time has sped. We're coming towards the end of this webinar. I'm now going to ask this excellent panel um, to sum up their message in two and a half minutes each, each panel. We'll start with you, Rob. Great. Thanks, uh, Michael. Again, um, I'd be first looking at uh, recognising the problem. Uh, and that really means looking at yourself as a practitioner uh, and um, using that, well, I guess the sixth sense, why aren't things getting better? Why are things getting worse? And what else is going on behind the scenes? And if we don't ask the question, no one's in fact actually going to give us the answer. And we may in fact just have a superficial patient doctor patient relationship and not really get to the core of what's causing this person's problem. Uh, I think we've brought up a number of key issues. One is that we need to look at a uh, chronic disease management situation and a team approach. We need to look at what team members are available to us around there. Um, the, the value of physical activity, but also the idea of um, uh, cognition and, and assessment of this patient in a broader perspective is going to do a lot of helping. And working with the patient herself, what does she want, what's her expectations and what does she in fact actually think and believe uh, and, uh, and trying to get to those so that we can make sure she's taking a medication and also complying with a lot of the lifestyle changes that are needed to make her better. And uh, if necessary, as Nick has put in, um, certainly consideration for someone who's got a, a longer standing depression, we need to give a trial of medication if nothing is happening with lifestyle intervention. Thanks very much, Rob. That was excellent, excellent summing up. Rosemary. Yeah, just really, just really um, focusing on what Sheila wants, what her perception of her disease is, what her thoughts about her future are, how how she sees her role, and whether she believes she'll be able to fulfil it, or whether that needs adjustment, and really developing the trust with her and finding out what she values, what what it is that um, she wants to do and achieve, and how she wants to how she sees herself recovering. That's fantastic. So much in so few words. <laughs> that was lovely. Nick, would you like to um, to just summarise how you have viewed this case and, and what we've talked about this evening? I thought we've, we've talked about a load, a load of huge range of approaches, um, but we should really centre upon one thing, which is really about um, identifying what Sheila wants to do and in imparting the information to her to enable her to make informed decisions. We've screened, if we identify that there is a condition, the most important thing is that we actually treat it. In this country, more depression is not treated than treated. And we're often doing things that really have very little evidence to support them rather than actually doing the things that we do know that work. Conversely, and I've seen a few sort of slightly concerning comments in the general chat saying, well, why wouldn't you be depressed if you were like this? Well, conversely, two-thirds or more people are not depressed. So this is something that is different. It's something that's different for her. If we identify it and identify with her what are the best ways of treating it and making sure that we do treat it adequately. Thanks very much, Nick. David? 
Yeah, well, I can give you a little bit more time because the other um, speakers have been um, have summarized fairly, fairly briefly and comprehensively. You're, you're the guy who's seen these patients in ICU, so I'll give you about five minutes to, to summarize how you see the situation. Okay. Well, depression, we can call it the forgotten risk factor. <clears throat> it's common, it's prevalent, makes people feel miserable, and unless we seek it out, and it's in at least 25% of our patients' low mood, maybe higher than that, um, then we don't know about it, and it influences whether the patients do follow our lifestyle measures and do that take their medication. So it is common, it's easy to screen for, and I see in the comments how about some other tools and complex tools. Yes, that'd be great, no problem. But at least get our practitioners asking two simple questions which will help to identify patients at low mood. Um, it's a risk factor which is important as diabetes. It's more common than diabetes. It's more important than smoking, dare I say. But many of our patients won't stop smoking because they do feel depressed. And when they stop, this is what happens actually. It can get worse. It's easily missed. Uh, let's screen with the PHQ2 to start with. It influences prognosis. And look, as Nick pointed out and others, look, there are many treatments, there are many roads to Rome. You don't have to use necessarily drugs. But you know what? We don't have to be afraid of drug therapy because we know it is safe and effective. Um, and you know, it's the therapist that counts. Be positive. We do know uh, cardiologists and doctors who are depressed have or have low mood are unhappy with their job. Why not say go and do something else? But Patients are far more happier and adherent if uh, you are happy and enjoy your job. And you know we're in an incredible position here, a privileged position to look after patients, and we have a duty to do the major thing in their quality of life, recognise that they may be depressed or anxious, acknowledge it, and if you don't know how to initiate therapy, there are plenty of good people out there who can help. So I think we need to be positive. And positive emotions also associated with a better outcome as well. Now it doesn't matter how you improve the depression. If it improves, compliance improves, people feel happier and they probably also have less further heart attacks. So really I think it's time to bring it out of the closet. Should we should destigmatize and I try and do that and say to patients, look, it's no big deal. You know, this is a common phenomenon. Don't feel as if this is an embarrassment and uh, you know we've got help for that. So Maybe that's enough. The message is it's common, it's an important risk factor, it's forgotten, we should destigmatize it, and I think it's time to treat and treatment work. As I said, we're talking to the converted here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can be positive with all our cardiologists say, leave it to me, we'll look after it, to everyone out there in uh, Webland. Thank you very much. Um, I feel uh, very humble um, summing up here tonight. Um, we've had four excellent speakers from different disciplines, from general practice, from uh, psychology, from cardiology, and from psychiatry, all uh, playing the same tune and all uh, of one mind. So if I may just briefly sum up uh, what we've heard tonight. Um, the most important thing I feel is to recognize the problem, not to be afraid to ask the question. And the questions are not, are not um, um, great. Do you have a low mood? Um, are you getting pleasure? Have you been getting pleasure out of life in the last month? So I think um, that David has put the name on the head is that we really need to have a, a fast and frugal way of, of assessing patients in the maelstrom that they meet when they go into a, 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 um, a cardiac care unit. There's no doubt uh, from all the evidence, and everybody has reiterated this tonight, that improving depression improves at outcomes when people um, have cardiac events. Uh, and that between 25 and 30, 33% of people are depressed following a myocardial infarction. We need to recognize it and we need to be positive. We need to engage with the patient. We need to uh, do both cardiac education and psychoeducation simultaneously. This is often only possible to do in a, in a large unit. It's often difficult for people in rural areas. 
but in fact in rural areas or in inner city areas where people don't have, have the access as they do sometimes in, in the private sphere, they can, they can often have a good GP or a good psychologist or a good um, social worker who can help to improve their lives. Physical activity is important, uh, both for cardiac well-being and for depression, and this has been brought out by many speakers tonight. The team approach, of course, is very important, and that's what MHPN is all about, coordinating conversations between different team members and improving outcomes for all of our patients and clients through team activities. Uh, Nick made the point very well that we need to screen and treat and recognize that our treatment does have positive outcomes and that it's not that it's, it isn't difficult. And no matter what the therapy, it often comes back down to you, our attendees, the therapists, uh, who make the biggest difference to our clients and patients. Outcomes. I thought that uh, that Rosemary's um, contribution was was fantastic. Um, she talked about those real-time things that we all talk about with our patients and clients, what their perception is of what's happening to them, what, how they see the future, and how the patient or client sees their role in things, engaging with the patient, and finding out what their key values are, and engendering a sense of trust um, with the patient. So all in all, this has been um, a very valuable night, I would hope, for all the attendees. Um, and certainly, I have very much enjoyed the expertise that has been on show tonight. I would ask all attendees uh, to please ensure that you complete the exit survey before you log out. It will appear on the screen after the session closes. Certificates of attendance for this webinar will be issued in four to five weeks. Each participant will be sent a link to online resources associated with this webinar within one to two days. This is our final webinar in 2013. We thank you very much, many of you repeat attendees, and I see the names coming up time and time again, for attending. It is you who makes this, um, these sessions good for our clients and patients. Um, if you wish to keep up to date with upcoming uh, webinars for 2014, please go to the upcoming webinars and hash app slash after uh, you log into mhpn.org.au. Once again, I would like to thank everybody from um, MHPN. I would like to thank all our attendees and mostly uh, and very importantly tonight for our very, very talented uh, presenters, David Colquhoun, uh, Nick Glosier, uh, Rob Grenfell and Rosemary Higgins. Thank you all and good night.